Greetings, and welcome to the Old Patrol HQ podcast. I'm your host, Gil Maza. Today, we bring you the next episode of our special series, Jeff Milton, the forefather of the modern-day Lion Watch agent. With me is Supervisory Border Patrol agent Air Bear Eltringham, Class 441, and Old Patrol HQ's foremost historian on all things Jeff Milton. He's currently assigned to teach operations at the Border Patrol Academy. He's been pursuing this subject for over 21 years. He brings a wealth of knowledge on the life and times of Jefferson Davis Milton. Prepare to be amazed and inspired as we embrace our rich history, heritage, and legacy with a few shenanigans along the way. Come take a listen. Hey, Bear. Welcome back to the Old Patrol HQ podcast and the special segment of Jeff Milton of the Jeff Milton series. Thanks for having me back. It's uh, It's been a hot minute and there's been a lot that's going on in between the last time we talked and this time and holidays and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, well, <laughs> it looks like we, we, we all survived the holidays into the new year. Uh, none the worse for wear for that part, but uh, started out with a bang. And yeah. uh, there is so much to share in the future of these podcasts and just keeping it quiet right now is just like, I know, I know you want to burst. I want to burst, but we can't, <laughs> we got to hold on. We got to, we got to hold the line for a little while longer. Little in the meantime, we've been going through Jeff Milton's life and career, you know, step-by-step, little-by-little right. to build up. But right. today we're kind of jumping ahead just a little bit because we wanted to kind of introduce everybody to the to the real meat and potatoes of where this podcast is going. And that will involve us discussing Jeff Milton's unbreakable connection right. and uh, undeniable connection to the Border Patrol and its early history. Because not only are we talking about Jeff Milton here, we're talking about a string of badasses that were trained by Jeff Milton Mm-hmm. And went on to become chiefs, even. But I don't want to get ahead too much, right? Right. But uh, yeah. let's 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 start from there. Well, um, yeah, it's good. Welcome to twenty twenty four, everybody. We're about <laughs> to be a hundred. Uh, yes, later this year we're a hundred years old. So part of what we wanted to talk about was the fact that the the impact that Jeff had on the foundations of the Border Patrol, like we were. You know, we've been kind of going through his life and all the overall aspect of it. But the longest period of time that he served in a law enforcement role was with the Immigration Service, Mm -hmm. which was the predecessors to the Border Patrol. Um, There were a lot of different things that were lumped into the Border Patrol as it was built. Um, But he started uh, his career with the immigration service in uh, 1904 uh, as a uh, a mounted Chinese inspector stationed in a foreign land. (laughs) He was actually stationed in Altar, Mexico for the first short period of his return to government service okay. prior to that he had been like we we will get to later on he had ridden the line in the 188 the late 1880s working for the customs service uh as a mounted customs inspector uh and he'd also he's also had a um a commission with the u.s marshals for a period of time as well and so he's done some government service, but this is kind of the start of from 1904 till his retirement, which was about 28 years of service with the immigration service. Dang. So you start thinking about this and start looking at the players and not trying to, to discount anybody, but honestly, he was riding the line. 20 years before the border patrol was founded wow and laid those foundations at that point and worked with some of the movers and shakers and worked with influential people as the border patrol was formed in its early infancy and was literally laid down i think personally as the archetype of what an agent should be and what they would become and 
he did that with some uh, some very interesting characters of our early early history in the border patrol. Um, One of the things I like to say, right, is that he is the prototype of the of the line watch of today's modern day line watch agent. And what Frank Berkshire Jr. had in mind when he was thinking of what kind of man is going to take on this job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going through a lot of the old documents and things and seeing (laughs) some of the things that that where him and Frank Berkshire agreed and where they didn't agree at points. And then for Frank Berkshire later on to come out with commissioner Caminetti and see firsthand the work that Jeff did, Jeff made him a believer in what he did and to turn around after having a little bit of a squabble early on to literally him approving things for him, making sure like some of the some of the write ups that I've shown and and given to people, like it talks about he worked five hundred and ninety seven hour five hundred and ninety seven days of overtime in a thirty six month period. What? And report, yeah, and that report was actually signed and typed up and signed by Frank Berkshire, and he said. Due to the fact of where he is and the job that he does, he's virtually on duty all the time. So they it, his his PWP basically was a 36-month period. And in that 36-month period, he worked 597 days of overtime. And he was still, I mean, at that point, 1600 and something dollars a year was his salary, not his you know, monthly or his, you know, bi-weekly right. take home. One day off of one day that. off a month. Now <clears throat> you mentioned earlier to me that him and Frank Berkshire didn't always see eye to eye. Uh, and there was a bit of some, it's a bit of office politics going on in that day. Yeah, there was a little bit. Um, at one point um, they basically what happened was <sighs> he worked very remotely. Most people don't realize. Um, I mean, at that time, His patrol route was from Tucson to Nogales to the Gulf of Mexico, back to through Yuma, back to Tucson. And it was him, his saddle horse and a pack mule and his camp gear. And he did that. That was his rotation. And anytime he would catch anyone, any aliens that he was responsible for, he'd have to break out his patrol route and go to the nearest point where there was a there was a train or a rail stop so he could convey those individuals to Tucson to go to immigration court Jeez. be removed. Um, so yeah, it was kind of out there. And if there wasn't anything happening, he didn't write a report about it. He didn't see the need to draw to, to ride from at the time, Quito Paquito or Altar or what's now known as cells, Arizona, which used to be known as Indian Oasis. Um, mm-hmm. Indian Oasis was the closest point that he had to get back to Tucson. If he was out in Quito Paquito or out it, by the Pinacate or down in Altar or over in Sonota, um, Sonora, why would you ride to Tucson to make a report of nothing happening? So the problem was became that he didn't make timely reports and he didn't like fluff up his reports. I mean, I, I literally imagine that. Yeah, he one of the greatest lines is in his in his application to the immigration service, there's a spot on there that says, Do you have any disabilities? Literally his answer written in cursive on the line says three bullet wounds, left arm, period. Jeez. Like that's all it was. It was like he's not gonna elaborate on it. He's not gonna so he's not gonna fluff anything up. So at that time. Berkshire was actually stationed in San Antonio and then moved up to El Paso, but he's not getting reports. So they're thinking he's not doing his work. So they literally demoted him and it took a a bit of actual work for them to come back around and be like, Oh no, they, they, they literally docked his annual pay. Jeez. By it was several hundred dollars a year. Because they, I can't remember the exact term. I'd have to go find the paperwork. But they were like, 
<clears throat> you know, he wasn't doing it. He's not doing his job. And the fact was, when Berkshire actually made his visit and actually saw what he did and how he worked, yeah, he became a complete proponent of Jeff Milton and whatever he needed. And, you know, he got at that, at that time, you know, they're like, they, he got sent to the world's fair in San Francisco to represent the immigration service. You know, he got called later on, you know, this is later on. He got called with, you know, kind of a quiet message was sent and said, get to New York right now. And he got to help um, with deportation of Emma. I believe it's Emma Goldman. Um, I have to go back and look once again, but well, so wait a minute here. Are you telling me that Jeff Milton had to do PAO work? Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> well, it wasn't PAO work. It was more. <laughs> it was more like he had to do ERO work because he the poor Yeah, but before that, going to the World's Fair. But yeah, he had to, literally had to do PAO work going to <laughs> going to representing the service at the World's Fair. Oh man! But so yeah, some things so, never change. Yeah, literally. Like, um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting that there was a little bit of that, you know, head shed versus the field kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, little little friction there for a little while. But then they saw what was actually happening, and and it was a it was a hundred and eighty degree turnout at that point. And it was very interesting because there was never any, there was never a grudge held. There was never any of uh, that kind of thing. Like when he retired, I looked at a I saw a newspaper article that uh, I found at a museum and was talking about him retiring and it was written. And he literally named off Frank Berkshire as one of the people that he worked for that he really respected. Okay. So, and that I think went both ways. It's very interesting to see some of the like not fit reps, but like his PWPs or his, you know, things that are, that are actually signed by Frank Berkshire and they're actually like other spots. I can't remember if it was, it was the application or what it was, but like it's initialed by Frank uh, Berkshire as well. And yeah, so we, and we got pictures we're going to show about that because I do yeah. have here a memorandum for uh, basically rating and efficiency. Yeah. And at this one that we have here, which we'll be showing on the video says he was rated at 98.25%. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes you wonder how huh, where that 1.75% where he lacked. Right. Because it was very interesting because prior to that, George Webb, who was in charge at El Paso, when his fit reps would go out, they were 100%. Um, so there was, like I said, there was a little bit, but yeah. you know, in the long term of things, the job got done. And, yeah, yeah, and, and no uh, bullshit about it. Yeah, literally, it's let's just do it. Let's go out and work. You know, that's just like PAs today. Just give me a set of keys to a ride and let turn me loose and let me go do my job. Exactly that work ethic, and that's one thing that that was known. Uh, he's had and was known for up until his entire well, his entire career. His you know, uh, it, I've I've read reports where it talks about his just completely unbelievable work ethic. But he's also like our modern PAs mm -hmm. has had his community complaints, oh, yeah. citizen complaints. Oh, yeah. All the way yep. up to the president and everything else, which that's something we're going to get into yep. as we as we go. But you, uh, we have here a collection of pictures that we're going to talk about today, just really highlighting, right? Highlighting the connection, right? That, that deep connection with Jeff Milton and the early agents of that day. So there will be the graphic up where everybody can see the picture. So let's start with that, and uh, you know, uh, going through your outline. Okay, let's start talking a little bit about that. <laughs> Yeah, that first picture is uh, a group of agents and Jeff Milton and his wife. Yes. And I don't know exactly Mildred. what date was was there, but on the right-hand side, you'll see Jeff Milton and was standing with his wife. And as you move your way across, there's some interest, very, very interesting characters in this picture that yeah. were uh, not under the influence of, but were that worked with him at times and and that looked at him as you know a subject matter expert well, um the would first you go guy, as far as to say they're journeymen um one of them at least one of them I at least because because you know when you look at the picture yeah you but, see jeff milton off to the side and mildred and these other ones but the first per, the first the first place your eye goes to is right up in the middle where that you know oh, good looking yeah. gentleman in that crisp uniform Right. So that that man is a guy by the name of Earl Fallis. Earl Fallis was um so he met Jill, Jeff Milton when he was 17. 
and he actually lived with him at his camp in Fairbank, Arizona, um, when he was younger and would go out in the desert with him and, and, and knew him. Uh, he joined the army. He fought in World War One, and uh, he also uh, f- went with General Pershing and chased Pancho Villa after the bombing of Columbus, New, Me- uh, New Mexico. Hmm. So he was involved with General Pershing's march into Mexico to to chase down uh, Pancho Villa and the Villistas. Uh, came back, got out uh, the army, and joined the Border Patrol in 1925 in Marfa. Served down there for a while, moved around, did his thing, ended up coming back to Tucson. And in this picture, he's the chief patrol inspector of Tucson at the time. Ah. <laughs> now, differences were, there weren't like, it wasn't the same sectors as they are today. Like, he would fall under El Paso because El Paso was like, it was more regional. Mm-hmm. There was the southern border, there was the northern border, there was that kind of stuff. So, um, very, very interesting character. I'm actually doing some more research on Mr. Fallis and going to do some more interesting stuff with some of the stuff that I've found about him, <clears throat> but, um, really looked at Jeff Milton kind of as a, um, I don't know, like a, just a, an all like he knew him prior to coming back to Tucson. So he used his, you know, his skill sets to teach new agents because I mean, literally when you read some of the stuff, like what Do- some of the things that Dobie Wright wrote, like when he joined up the border patrol, they literally handed him a set of keys to the office and said, show up at midnight. <laughs> it was, that was how it went, you know, like, yeah. Um, they, they just, they didn't have any training. They had to rely on what they had. They, you know, they didn't have a whole lot. So I think what Dogie Wright said was we walked around acting like we knew what we were doing. Yeah. Even though when I, when I interview a lot of the early old patrollers, they mm-hmm. say that they would report to the, to their duty stations and sometimes work, you know, you know, three, four, six weeks up, you know, a few months before they even went to the Academy. Right. They were yep. already doing basically, mm-hmm. you know, enforcement work out in the field. Right. So yeah, he he definitely employed Jeff um, or asked him probably a lot to help. Um, and as we move across the picture, we'll find out a lot more about that. But um, yeah, I would say that um, that he was he modeled himself after that kind of work, you know. And like, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. I know somebody that actually has been doing this for a long time, so I'm going to go ask him for help to actually help my people get their job done. Um, so as you move to the left, the guy, there's a guy standing there right next to the guy in the smoky and he's wearing a fedora hat. Mm-hmm. And that is a guy by the name of George J. Harris. Now, George Harris, he was the second and the fourth and the only two time chief of the United States Border patrol. Oh, wow. So he was the chief of the border patrol from nine nine in 1926 and 27. Mm -hmm. Now the third chief of the border patrol was Frank Berkshire. And then the fourth chief of the border patrol was George Harris again, again, from 1932 to nine in, in 1932 and 1933. And then Mr. Harris went on to be the assistant commissioner general of immigration. Okay. So you're talking about a sector chief and a two-time border patrol chief and the only two-time border patrol chief in that picture and a commissioner at that point, (laughs) like in that picture. So as you continue to move left across the picture, there's a, there's a guy standing there, doesn't have a hat on. Mm -hmm. That guy's name is Nick Douglas Collier or Nicholas Donald Collier. Sorry. Okay. Um, he's in, he's in uniform as well, wearing the, uh, the riding pants type thing, uh, with the taller boots. Nick Collair went on to be the seventh chief of the border patrol between 1948 and 1950. Um, and I have a letter that you're going to show up, put up and I'll, I'll talk about it here, but 
basically he talked about Jeff Milton at, as his journeyman and showing him how to actually do it, what it is. So those are three major characters right there that, and actually four, if you, I mean, you think about it, you're talking about a, a for better or worse, a sector chief in more than one area. Cause George Fallis actually, I mean, uh, Errol Fallis actually left and went back to Texas Okay, uh, later on down the line and uh, retired there in Alpine. Um, and interestingly enough, <laughs> Earl Fallis documented the early days of the Border Patrol. And I'm actually, I'm actually on the phone tomorrow to some people that have a bunch of records. He was very prolific. Uh, he took a lot of photographs. Yeah, does, doesn't the um, Arizona Historical Museum or Foundation have all the, yeah. that collection? They have that. There's so many. They have that. They have several items of Mrs. Milton's. They have a lot of items of Jeff's. Um, okay. There's some really neat things coming out of that. Um, but yeah, are we ever gonna see that stuff out in the open? Uh, yeah, you, there might be. <laughs> <laughs> some things I'm getting involved with. There may be some things showing up in, okay, okay. in certain places. Uh, <laughs> and I can't can't break completely yet. Not yet. Uh, not yet. But um so he documented uh photography wise a lot of things that happened early on in the patrol and with you know camera and, and film. Um one of the very interesting things, like I've looked through some of his photographs already and, you know, I, I've seen pictures of him, you know, at Milton's home, having dinner with him and Mrs. Milton and, yeah, you know, different events. Like when Jeff was uh, commissioned as a Colonel in the Arizona militia by the governor of Arizona, you know, he's there photographing that and, and capturing that for future hopefully border patrol agents you know that would find it and somehow yeah. lost it and i'm trying to reclaim that and, and get that back out there but one of the really really interesting things that i'm waiting to see is there's a photograph somehow some way jeff milton came into possession and owned a very famous shotgun by a very famous person and later on in life drum roll he gave that shotgun to Earl Fallis, and that shotgun belonged to Doc Holliday. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I've been chasing a lot of weapons lately, uh, some some different things that I've found. Some, I've been pointed in several directions. So, uh, so before you go too far, okay, I don't want to just skip over that moment. You know, cause, So you, can you repeat it slowly so us knuckle draggers can understand it? So there's a shotgun. Mm -hmm. that belonged to none other yep. right, than Doc Holliday. Yep. Okay. And we don't know if it was the same one in the movie. We don't know any of that. But I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> right. And so somehow Jeff Milton comes in possession of that particular shotgun. Yep. And it's easy to understand because he worked in Tombstone, right? He was in Tombstone. Right. Mm -hmm. So, And he came across a lot of colorful characters that we're going to get into right. later. But yeah. and then he gifts... Doc Holliday shotgun to Earl Fallis. Yeah. Oh, I had to catch my breath on that one. Sorry. Okay. So you want to catch your breath on another one? Well, you know, you know, as long as you don't make me pass out. There is, I found photographs of it. I don't know who owns it now because it was sold at auction. So I'm contacting auction houses and leaving my information and asking them to pass it forward. <laughs> But Earl Fallis, he also gave Earl Fallis the, it was the 10 gauge lever action shotgun that he used. Fairbanks. Had the Fairbanks train oh, route. shit. See, Fairbanks is Jeff Milton's OK Corral. Literally. And, so, yeah. you know, and that's the only reason why. Wyatt Earp is probably is more popular than, uh, J than Jeff Milton is because, uh, the Fairbanks incident wasn't as popular and as widespread. And it was a little more clear cut, right? Because the mm. Earps became kind of criminals in a way. They kind of were seen as criminals for what happened at OK Corral. But Jeff Milton was was uh, fulfilling, was doing your basic law enforcement, yeah. right? He was and, actually um, a 
Marshall at that point. Yeah. US so he's, Marshall. You know, so nobody questioned Jeff Milton's actions at Fairbanks at the Fairbanks shooting. And we still get to visit some of the, you know, one of the one of the casualties there, three finger yeah. Jack Dunlop, right? But um, but that was mm. so so now that 10 gauge that was used in that is was also gifted to Earl Fallis. Yeah, and his family, and it's been it was actually on display for a long period of time at um <clears throat> at the tombstone courthouse okay. uh, and when he when he passed away they gave it back to the family the family passed it on to somebody else ended up and i, I don't know all the provenance on it but i do know that that's the one that i because i thought it was there was another one that i saw that was sold in like 2001 that i thought it was that shotgun and it's not i thought it was a double barrel 10 gauge that i know is his as well so i've been able to pretty much figure out that there are somewhere between 12 and 15 guns out there that I know of that are his. Now you have been pursuing Jeff Milton for 23 years now. 22. Right? 22 Probably. years gathering together all the information, all the research, the endless rabbit trails that this has taken you including the stuff that his dad did that you know some of the stuff his dad was involved in yeah. that we still think about in history you know uh, i'll just say swamp fox but we'll keep it at that for now yeah and you and you currently for some unknown reason seem to be garnering all these connections where all this equipment from jeff milton across the country you know you're you're putting all this kind of database together uh, knowing where they all are and yeah. even garnering you know certain permissions to do certain yeah. things that are going to happen eventually but that's an amazing feed in and of itself it's been a lot of trails i, <laughs> I don't yeah. know how many times i've sent you a message oh going, yeah and going hey here's a new rabbit trail for you yes I do this all the time i'm gonna i'm gonna shout out to my boss here because he says i never shout out to him so i'm gonna shout out to him um yeah, it, it's <laughs> he's like every once in a while I'll just walk by his office and like I'll have printed something out and drop it on his desk and he's like you have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I, just I don't know how you keep track far. of how do you keep track of all this? And my my brain's ready to explode. I mean, I thought I had this love for Jeff Milton from the beginning, just with the little bit that I heard, mm -hmm. not even knowing and understanding just how far, wide, and deep. The, the tendrils of this man's history, of his legacy, of his work, everything he's done, not just outside the patrol, but also inside, literally makes him, I mean, I'll tell you something, I, the fact that there's no Netflix or Prime show, you know, with his name on it, that boggles the mind, which hopefully we, we can change in the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to make that I may have made a connection on that as well. No, I don't. That, that, that's... That I may have made a connection on some of that stuff as well. So there's some there's some interesting things coming. Um, one of the things that I can't wait to do is <laughs> not long ago, I spoke with someone and I through chasing leads and making phone calls and things like that. I was able to locate his saddle. Mm that he rode the line on and I can't wait to just be able to put my hand on that. Oh, just a, yes. Just to kind of touch the Holy grail of the old West. Right. But yeah. let's get back here to this letter because mm -hmm. it's very interesting. You know, now you have, you have tons of documentation. Mm -hmm. Oh, and all that, ha that from the beginning have called Jeff Milton, the first border patrolman, the first border patrol agent. And yes, there was other mounted patrol. There was oh, yeah. other mounted officers and everything else like that, but um, and everybody did their own thing, you know. And 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 I'm sure, eventually, we I really would like to see us get around to their histories as well because they're just oh, as yeah. important. But Jeff Milton, the reason why he is so unique and why we're showcasing him here in this particular area is because of his direct impactful mm -hmm. influence he's had on a bunch of these guys in this picture that we showed right with right. uh you know earl fallis george harris nick Collier, all of them in their own right badass border patrol agents yep went on to do some really great things i yeah. know like you just you think about it and you're just like you look at that picture and you stand there and go you know that that's the it's almost like elliot ness like the untouchables, you know, mm -hmm. like, and I can't wait 
to be able to chase more because I've been reaching out a lot about Earl Fallis and about Nick Collier. I've actually talked to Nick Collier's granddaughter. Wow. And she loves it when I find new things on her grandfather. And so she's well aware of his history with Jeff Milton oh, yeah. and himself. Oh, yeah. Okay. She actually said Mr. Milton had great influence on my grandfather. And uh, yeah, we're supposed to go up north and, and do some do some meeting with them eventually. Um, Chief Collier is actually uh, buried here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, okay. So he's his And family. the thing about it is, right, is that Jeff Milton, uh, even with the, the monstrous data and information that we're putting together and we have about him and everything else, he's just the beginning because now if we ever started getting into the individual stories of Earl Fallis, George Harris, and then, hell, all the way up until today – I've always maintained, Bear, I've always maintained that in spite of the environment, in spite of the admin, in spite of the politics of it, there are still sign cutters and highwaymen in the Border Patrol that could do the job, could, could go back there 10, 20, 100 years ago and do the job with those guys and not yep. feel like they were too much, you know, they were too much nuggets. You know, yeah. to do the job that, you know, that are excellent sign cutters. So we have not lost. I don't believe we lost an iota of that. I we haven't had a it, chance to maybe put it into practice, right? But yeah. we haven't lost that thread. We've and we are not far removed from the basics of what they did. Yes, the basics of literally going out, riding the line, and cutting sign. Mm -hmm. We just have a lot more cool toys today. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, like everything else, and you, I think you even mentioned the fact that there have been, you know, centennial aged. Border Patrol agents oh, yeah. that, that went to that have gone to Tucson, I think, or Nogales, and said, "Man, if we only had what you guys have, we'd yeah. have really killed it out there." Yeah, that was uh, Marion Russell. I, okay, yeah. I, when I got to meet Marion Russell, we we ended up taking him down to Nogales Station, and he was just blown away. And it was just, it was so awesome to sit there with that man and go, "Sir, did you know Jeff Milton?" And he says, "Oh yeah, we used to go to his house and have coffee." Ugh. <laughs> I, I tell people all the time i shook the hand of the man that shook the hand of the man that established what it is that we do and drank his coffee yeah exactly so tell so, us a little bit about the, um, what was it about this letter that um nick collar <laughs> wrote uh about jeff milton that got your attention so he was actually at the time this is in 1947 that he wrote this letter and <clears throat> interestingly enough i found out that the that the, that the Border Patrol actually had gotten, the Immigration Service had gotten forced out of D.C. at that time. There wasn't enough office space and all that stuff. So they were actually operating out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hmm. And that's where headquarters was, um, very interestingly enough. But I was reading this letter. It's about a, say it's a six or seven page letter when you sit down and read the whole thing. But there was something right up front that, you know, that caught my attention right off the bat. And it's the third paragraph down. It literally says, as you know, Jeff and I had made many trips into the Arizona deserts, lying between Nogales on the east, the Colorado River on the west, and the Southern Pacific Railroad on the north. These trips were made prior and subsequent to his retirement. Mm. It was to say... The Border Patrol depended largely upon Jeff to train personnel in the ways of the deserts, wow. the locations of water, and the trails over which all manner of aliens had surreptitiously entered the United States for many years. It was through him that I learned to love the desert with its heat, barren mountains, and dry washes. Oh, my God. Now, if that doesn't just say, yeah, that was my journeyman, I don't know what does. Like, and he spells it out, and he's in a position of influence at this point because this is 1947. Yeah, 1947. You, it, you go back and look. Guess what? Nick D. Collier became the chief of the Border Patrol in 1948. Oh, and wow. then in 1950, he was done being he was done working for the Border Patrol, retired, and he went to Japan. And helped establish the immigration system in Japan and helped establish their police system wow. after World War II. 
Maybe he should have gone to China. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but it's just one of those things where you're just like, this yeah, man, international influence. You know, like it's not like it was just a, oh, he was, you know, he was a border patrol and retired and blah blah blah. But yeah, now I'm gonna pl- I'm gonna put this up for everybody to see. But you, we got to read the, the that next paragraph though. For some time prior to the trip, during the course of which we thought that we might lose our lives due to an insufficient or due to an insufficiency of H2O. We had been receiving information in the district office at El Paso, Texas, to the effect that East Indians were again using the desert route in gaining illegal entry into the United States. It has always been difficult to establish timely and accurate sources of intelligence information in Mexico regarding such illegal entries. Although considerable vague information could be secured from many sources down the west coast from Mazatlan to Hermosillo, where the trails always cooled. It was for this reason that Jeff and I decided to cut sign. Cut sign. The full length of the border from Sonoida to a point south of Tinajas Altas. At least. How'd you have to call in that cut? Yeah, right. (laughs) We were to just. We were to decide upon our arrival at the latter point whether or not we would attempt to continue on down the international line to the Rio, Colorado. Jeez, there's so much there. Well, there's so much more inside this letter that's very, very interesting. Um, It's further along. They got stuck really bad. and They thought they were going to die because they were out of water. They were out of, you know, and they... It is in the shifting sands and dunes that are south of the line because they didn't. It wasn't like they were in the United States. They were actually riding the road in Mexico, so they were actually operating in Mexico and cutting sign in Mexico for northbound traffic, and then they would go check it out and see if it was worth anything. Yeah. But one of the things that was very interesting was he said, you know, they were out in the desert in the sun, the heat of the day, and they'd gotten to the point where they were going to literally, they were going to drain the radiator of the car and separate the water and the coolant, split it, and Nick was going to go on foot, and Jeff was going to stay with the car. And they had stripped everything down, they'd gotten rid of all their equipment, this, that, or the other thing. And he said, he goes, it was on that day that I was sitting out in that blistering sun that I, he goes, I thought I knew Jeff Milton. But it wasn't until that day that I knew Jeff Milton and the kind of person and character that he was and how he never lost his sense of humor and he never quit trying to take care of his partner and make sure that his partner would make it. Which is, again, two qualities that we know and love and and all the best PAs. Yeah. So... That's a it's a very long letter. Um, it maybe someday we'll just do a a podcast, maybe just on that letter, you know, yeah. and well, read that and everything that that came from it. It's really really interesting. And not only that, but the next letter could have been redlined by a soup, <laughs> right? <Probably. laughs> because is it me or did he spell friends wrong up top there, or did he type it wrong? I think they got typed wrong. <laughs> Yeah, but like, yeah, go back and fix that. Yeah, one. go back and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that next picture that you're going to end up putting up is uh, it's a from 1907, and it's one of basically his it's his efficiency report. Yeah, which we talked about earlier a little bit, right? July from Frank 1907 from from Frank Berkshire. Um, yeah. Wow. You know, it's stamped with his name and it says supervising inspector because at that time they were still Chinese inspectors. Um, mm-hmm. So that's where that kind of now isn't that kind of ironic though when you think about what's going on right now, right? They had to actually create this position of Chinese inspectors to mm-hmm. go out and mitigate that traffic coming in, and now we got Chinese pouring into this country in oh, yeah. in a way that you know, let's just say does not honor our ancestors. But yeah. uh, unbelievable that, you know, how we've come almost, you know, I don't know if it's full circle or not, but we've never seen. So let's put it this way. 
back in the day, it was probably unprecedented because it was in the beginning. Right. Now yeah. it's unprecedented in its in just the scope and magnitude of it because we have never been so wide open. And I'm not going to get political about it, but that's but but just the, stating the reality of it, right? They're pouring into this country in a, in in an unmitigated, unlimited way that wasn't has never been seen before. Yeah, there's some very interesting articles that I found about some <clears throat> like Jeff found a group of 16 uh, Chinese that were executed by their smuggler. Jeez. You know, and out there near, near the Pinacate and, you know, like they, there's some, some tangent lines that I've been chasing about those time periods as well. And some information that I found that, that, talks about how you know the desert has never been an easy place to cross and i remember when i was in pao in tucson and and i remember the year that we hit a hundred deaths and you know it's and you i don't know many pas that have worked the desert that haven't come across somebody who's not made it you know oh yeah and it's been a thousand just a thousand that's just in the last in last year not 24 but in 23 a thousand you know illegal alien crosser deaths out there that have been that have been counted and and texas is like we're running out of morgue space we're running out of trailers we're running out of all those kind of things so let me ask you this is there a body of is there somewhere in some archives somewhere all these incident reports that Jeff Milton had to do on different on different things he encountered in the field and are you going to get access to that <clears throat> i don't know um i i know i know where his and pocket chief notes, if you're listening i know where some of his pocket notebooks for his daily like what he did are at and I haven't had a chance to go through them. I know where they're in. Actually, it's very interesting because they're in two different places. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to have to do some, but there's one that I'm looking forward, truly forward to. And it's from like 19, the the notebooks cover a period of time from 1920 to 1927. Oh, geez. So that's going to be an interesting. That'll be pure gold right there. But um, there are some copies of some stuff. The problem becomes is, a lot of the old records, you know, most of his records and most of his reports would have been in the immigration service and in El Paso. Now, when Haley wrote his stuff, you know, that was still being held there. Yeah. Um, still kind of fresh, too. I mean, think about it. He retired in 32. So, I mean, his reports were coming in until 32. So, when Haley was looking at this stuff... He actually started researching his book in 1937. It was when he first met Milton and started actually learning about him and kind of doing some research on him. And I actually found a very interesting document not long ago about it was written by the director of the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma. And he did a book review and it was probably 27 or 28 pages long on Milton's biography and everything that Haley went through, the people that he talked to, he actually went like to Haley and got like notes and things like that and talked about how he went about writing Milton's book biography and how he did a lot of, you know, scholarship in terms of meeting with people and confirming stories that he had heard from Milton and lots of times what happened was that the stories were, he downplayed them a lot. Yeah. And the people that were like, yeah, that is literally what happened. But there was a lot more to that. <laughs> so I was like, Here, let me show you my angle of it. And there's but all just like his reports, right? His reports yeah. were strict, cut and dry to the point. Literally. And uh, yeah, but yeah, the reality is, this is off. literally something where Jeff Milton's life, the facts are actually better than fiction. Exactly. Yeah. It's, and the more I run into things and the more rabbit trails I find and the more phone calls I make, the better it gets. And it's just, I've, uh, yeah, I keep my, everybody keeps telling me, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. All right. I'm well, going to write a book. Yeah. It's going to happen. Right. So, oh, and, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Don't go, don't. 
Yeah, so you're telling us, everybody listening to this podcast right now, that a a, a book by Air Bear Eltringham on Jeff Milton is coming. It will be coming. It will okay. be a little while because I'm still working and stuff like that, and got a brand new baby that's she'll mm-hmm. be four, four weeks old this this week, and and uh, you know it's or four months old. Sorry, not four, so four months old this week. Um, but. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to be writing, and well, it's, at this found, point, it needs to be. I mean, well, and I found a lot of interesting artifacts. His was more of a the the original book was actually very interesting. Um, only about one third of the information that Haley had went into that book. Uh, Two thirds of it didn't make it into the book. Well, again, Haley not only wrote about Jeff Milton's life, but he would paint the picture of everything Mm. going on around them. So you could kind of have a little context of the way Jeff Milton did things in those particular situations. Right. And a lot of what I'd like to do is kind of go back through and look at some of the things of his life early on in the book, and then start talking about his influence in the immigration service and the border patrol at the, at its infancy you know, 28 years doing that. I mean, the other things have been covered, you know, him being a Texas Ranger, him being a U.S. Marshal, him being a deputy in multiple places. I want to, the, the people that he influenced in the early days of the Border Patrol, and not even in the early, like in the early, but continued on through, like as we'll find out later on. Here yes, I mean, this, go, this goes, for the, it, what, everything we've talked about right now, it goes yeah. far beyond that. Right. But um, yeah. if I may make a suggestion, I mean, you know, if it worked for Joe Banco, it could probably work for you. <laughs> and I think maybe for this centennial, and I don't know where you're going to find the time, you know, Joe came out with the centennial timeline book. And I have and, a copy of it. <laughs> and me, oh, me too, right? Where is it? It's right here. I got that along with my coin and and uh, all signed and beautiful. Look at that. Huh? Did you look at the back page? Um, you know, go look at the back page. Am I looking at the right one? Yeah. Oh, the back the, page. Back page is in the book. Oh, look at that. <laughs> There's a yeah. piece of my artwork right there. Representing Jeff Milton, right? And his stuff. Yeah. So, um, that's that's dirt's great, great grandfather's weapon. Uh, yeah, that's right. The one in which that podcast, we did that podcast already, and I'm looking forward to having dirt back with us. I'm just suggesting that maybe a Jeff Milton timeline for the centennial might not be a bad thing. I'm just saying, I don't know if I can do that. There's a lot. There's a lot. And and again, we know you're very, 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 very busy. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, because it's uh, the centennial is coming in some. It is coming. Yeah. It is coming. We're gonna, I'm trying to figure out something. Um, I'm I'm setting up a website right now. Um, I'm not going to announce what it's named yet, but um, probably next podcast I'll have it at least sorted out and started. And I'm probably going to start putting some stuff up on that. And because this isn't just my information, this is the patrol's information. This is this is everybody in the patrol, everybody who's been in the patrol. I want everybody to know where they come from. I want you know, like yeah, our history that built who we are today. Yeah, and like the, and Joe and, has and, done and, an amazing job of that, and I'm hoping Joe and Cliff have done such an amazing job of preserving our history and finding yes. history and. What I want to do is find characters in our history and expand on those characters specifically. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I will never have the grandiose overarching, you know, knowledge that, that Chief Bonco or, or, or Chief Gill or Chief Hambeck or any of those guys will have. They have such a broad overview of everything and all these things. I, I literally went macro and went one character at a time yeah your like, key brain like, can only handle yeah, can, literally, can barely like, wrap itself around jeff milton much less literally. yeah the entire history of the patrol i mean right. that's a month and yes let it let's please emphasize mm-hmm. you know cliff gill and joe banco oh, and the yeah. others that have worked so hard yeah. in in an uphill battle right because uh, even now, there's not a lot of the patrol that's in, that that's even interested in it, 
And right. a lot of people in the patrol, to your and my surprise, didn't even know who Jeff Milton was to yeah. begin with, right? And so Very far up, they've too. been doing this work for decades, and you and I, you know, are coming in. But now, again, I will say, I know, I know that you are not in it for the glory. You're not in it for any kind of personal recognition. You're not mm -hmm. in it for any kind of personal gain or reason, none whatsoever. And anybody that doubts that doesn't even know you. But I, what I do know is you're, you want not only to give Jeff Milton the proper place in our history mm -hmm. of the patrol, but you also want every single one of us in a, that ever that wears a green uniform, that's ever worn a green uniform, to own it. As yeah. part of our legacy. Yeah, I want it's that somehow, some way, I want Jeff Milton to be the chesty puller of the Border Patrol. Oh, yeah. But it literally, you know, that I want people to know who he is, what he did, where he, who he influenced, why he influenced them. And then I want to build those characters around him. Like the, you know, Earl Fallis. Yeah. Well, yeah. Many people know who he is or what he did. Yeah. Not very many. You know, the George Harris's. Why why was it so important that, you know, that these guys would come to him and talk to him and, you know, Nick Collair, literally, like it I've got a picture of Nick Collair that I will that we're gonna eventually put up in that photograph. It's two different things. You see, you see the passing of the of the flame. You see that this is me handing you the baton. You're the next generation. I'm entrusting you with this. And you inside that photograph, you see that. You see that journeyman looking at his training and going, it, it's on you now. Take this and run with it. I've given you the foundations, but you have to take forward and you have to build on what I've taught you. Yeah. And you see at the same time, you know, you see the old West meets Elliot Ness, the new generation, young G man, you know, you yeah. see the guy, you see the salty journeyman that's there in his old Western clothes. And you see the young guy in his fedora hat and his polished shoes and his suit. And, and the one thing that you see is you see a guy who was somebody's trainee finally feeling like he's received his the approval of his journeyman for yeah. a job well done which like it or not i mean uh, i mean and i won't say maybe i shouldn't say like it or not because up until the time i joined the patrol i wanted to please my journeyman I oh, had yeah. some, we had some jerks and there was a few jerks out there but our main core guys i wanted to impressed them i wanted to please them i wanted to make sure that they what they were trying to teach me was getting in what was sinking in and, and and so there's that element of it and i believe and i'll say this right now and i'm, I'm not saying you agree with it or not but taking away the journeyman for the the senior patrol agent journeyman from the patrol was the beginning of the end for a lot of the stuff that allows us to share the history heritage and legacy along with all the bad habits along with all the good habits and right. everything else but it was the journeyman that churned out That's, and made or break the agent in the field right that was the yeah that was they were i had some really great journeymen mm -hmm. not only as an agent but as a soup I had some pretty interesting characters when I first showed up as a suit and I wanted to make sure that I was being the right kind of soup for them. And it was, you know, I still talk to some of those guys today, you know, and it's, it's really nice to be able to look back and go, there was, you know, and I learned a lesson early on. There was, a, there was the guys that are young in the patrol, you know, they're, they're three, five years in, you know, that, maybe seven yeah you tell them guys what to do you tell them hey i need you to go do this for me when a guy's got 25 plus in you ask him to do something for you hey could you do this for me and that's how you earn their respect because you respect their you respect their position and their their knowledge and their seniority and literally from night one as a new soup, you know, I 
had a guy that, you know, I was like, can you do this for me? He's like, I got it. Roger that. Appreciate it. I asked him when I was getting ready to leave and transfer out. I was like, hey, did anything ever happen? He's like, nothing you needed to worry about. I'm like, Roger that. <laughs> you know, like, it's, you know, so but there's. You know, also that um, I believe that right now the Border Patrol is in desperate need of heroes, right? Uh, when you first came in. I bet you could rattle off a bunch of names of guy of, of guys that are your heroes that are all wear that all wore a green uniform. Oh that are yeah. your heroes. Yeah, these guys are like you stand in awe of them. Yeah. And you're like you stand there and you go, I wish I could be that kind of a guy. I want I feel like that that was the measuring stick. And then that's the the thing that I want with Jeb Melton is I want yeah. people to look at him and go, Do I measure up to that? And I look at it and I go, I fall down all the oh, time, yeah. that, oh, you yeah. know, but I still try to get up and still try to, to do the right thing and do the, do the good thing for that. And, and hopefully some of the things that are coming up, come to pass. And, and like I said, hopefully we can put him back in a place that a lot of people know about him. Yeah. A lot of people will, will see the good that he did. So We'll go down this rabbit trail again later. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we got a couple of you got a few minutes left. Let's discuss these last few uh, pictures that we that you had here in the outline. The next one seems to be uh, what it's a uh, a letter from Berkshire talking uh, about. Yeah, it's okay. Basically, it was uh, Frank Berkshire's. Uh, is in 1915. It was a letter that basically talked about a job that he did, and he had been waiting on some. Uh, <laughs> basically some pay or no this was uh they were basically sending him on detail on this one um, okay it was you know you're going to proceed from your official station at 7 a.m you know to turner arizona and you're gonna where you're gonna join the commissioner general of immigration uh alfred e burnett and a writer and you're going to proceed to naco and show them you know basically tell them about what you're going to do and you know how it's going to happen and how they're going to appropriate, you know, expenses are being appropriated from the regulating immigration act of 1915, uh, you know, in which your voucher in which such expenses are charged in the department authority above mentioned, as well as this letter must be referred to, but it's signed by Frank Berkshire. Hey, you know, I know you're taking, so basically they sent out the commissioner <laughs> of immigration and a writer and a couple other guys. And he was like, Hey, put them on horses and take them out and show them what you do. <laughs> so that was basically your 10, 12 visit. Yeah. Literally yeah. like your 10, 12 visit by, you know, approved by you are now the PAO in that area. <laughs> I'm, I'm approving you to do this. Uh, don't force oh, it. Look good. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. So, yeah. That was pretty neat. Um, and then, uh, the next one, um, is, so when when he was retired, um, he was dropped by the Economy Act in 1932. And Grover Wilmoth, uh, the district director of immigration in the El Paso district, wrote a letter to him that was very, um, very poignant, to say the least, mm -hmm. talking about his um, what he did and, and his impact on his area you know his area and other things and interestingly enough uh grover wilmoth actually uh i have a i have a memorandum written by mr wilmoth request he wrote one of the earliest uh memos uh this was in 1929 cliff yeah. found <laughs> uh, you can find it on the honor first website but uh he wrote requesting offense <laughs> Uh, imagine barrier, that imagine a that. barrier between <laughs> that uh I thought, I thought fences didn't work no no it's, uh, <laughs> don't get it started but it's it's just interesting that all the way back into you know yeah. 1929 you know they were looking for that but was another thing that was very interesting was he wrote some of the earliest um i have a picture a cop from a copy of a um immigration law book for the academy that he wrote um, so, you know, there's another person of influence, you know, that yeah. knew him and that kind of thing, but the, and so anything out of this letter that, uh, that jumps that you want to read out to us. And so you can to kind of get an idea of what it says. 
Well, actually, I could probably read it. It says, it says, Dear Jeff, much against my inclination, I have sent you a wire quoting bureau message as your, to your discontinuance at the close of business June 30th. There had not been, uh, sorry, missed one. I wanted to delay it, hoping that a mistake had been made, but I knew there had not been and that you should have the notification at the earliest possible moment so that you could make your plans accordingly. Mm. I cannot begin to tell you how sorry I am and how much I shall miss you. I consider that the separation will be a bigger loss to the service than to you personally. Wow. Your friends and they are legion, have come to regard you as an institution rather than an individual. Yeah. You have said that you are 70 years old, but I consider you as 70 years young. I wish that some of our younger men were as active and as competent and as efficient as you. Hmm. But aside from the activities of daily routine, no immigration officer has your value in cultivating for the service the goodwill and friendship we must have for the effective enforcement of the law. Mm. It goes on and says a little bit more beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, they, to have people regard you as an institution in your service says a lot about your service specifically the, the you know, the, the work that you do and the, you know, the, the things that you've done. You know, yes. And the amount of friends that he had, you know, there was a letter that I read that said that the amount of friends he had was only, the, you know, like the only thing that stopped him having more friends was the population of where he worked because everybody, no and everybody liked him. And not only that, you've said it before. I think that uh, up until the day he died, mm -hmm. he was being looked after by the Border Patrol to yeah. the very day. Yep. All the way through. And even after that, people would, you know, take care of, you know, they kept an eye on Mrs. Milton and, you know, they helped out where they could. And yeah, uh, yeah it was, he had a very big impact on his community and on just the border, you know, agents going by and people coming by. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't want you to finish this podcast without. Without this particular, this oh no, no, you, uh, we, we're not going to let this go. I don't care if we're holding people late. I don't care, but we're not <laughs> letting this one go by. So, talk to us about the last graphic that we're going to put up here for everybody to see. All right, this is a letter that was sent by the Border Patrol Museum and Memorial Foundation uh, in 1981, and actually, it was very interesting because it was, I believe, accompanied. I've seen somewhere there's a letter in response to this that there were some. Um, there was an accompanying letter as well to the um, to OPM from Chief Brandemule, Buck okay. Brandemule. Um, and that letter references Chief Brandemule's letter as well. But this is um, Don Coppock, who was the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Border Patrol Museum, okay. writing to um, a guy by the name of Philip Schneider. He was the Deputy Assistant Director for work Workforce Information uh, at OPM. And this is September 5th of 1981. And it says, Dear Mr. Schneider, it is requested that the official personnel file of Jeff Milton, parentheses, yeah. the first immigration Border Patrol officer, be made available on a permanent basis to the Border Patrol Museum and Memorial Library Foundation. Mm. The the very interesting thing is about this is if you look on the left side under the Board of Trustees, yes, there are two very prominent names in the Border Patrol that are listed there. The first one being William H. Jordan, mm. otherwise known as Bill Jordan. Um, and the other one is E.A. Dogie Wright, who is a giant in the Border Patrol. Mm -hmm. Those men saw him as a very large figure at the foundation of the Border Patrol. So Dogie Wright joined the Texas Rangers in 1918. 
and he joined the Border Patrol when it started in 1924. Well, what a lot of people don't know is he also served as an assistant chief in Tucson under Chief Fallis. Mm. So he knew Jeff well as well. So, excuse me, there's other people like a guy by the name of Harry Hanna who retired as the uh, basically the PAIC of uh, San Ysidro when mm -hmm. the Border Patrol Station at San Ysidro. Um, he retired in 1948. He had been riding the line with Milton back in the early, early days. I think he joined in 1911 or something along those lines and rode with him. And he mentioned him in uh, an article that I have a, a picture of uh, as one of the early, one of the first as well. So well, it's a, I wanted you to talk about this because, you know, it's on official letterhead. It's from the Border right. Patrol Museum. And right. somehow this gentleman here, right, um, Donald Kopak, gets the impression from somewhere, somehow, that Jeff Milton is the first immigration Border Patrol agent, officer, right? He says officer. Yeah. First immigration. Where, where would he possibly officer. get that idea, Bear? <laughs> From the old patrollers, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure it was passed down as pretty much as historical fact to them. Right. Yeah. It, it's a, and it's, he's not on a technicality kind of thing. Literally. I mean, and he's, he was never assigned as a border patrol agent. No, yeah, we, we we know that, right? We know yeah. he never he never wore the uniform. He never yeah. received the badger credentials. He didn't go to the Border Patrol Academy. He did none right. of those things, but he lived the life. He patterned the life. Everything from PAO to pay issues to citizen complaints to allegations. Everything that deportations, that, right? And, and then getting you know detailed out, yep. doing ERO work, doing transport work. You know, border patrol agents. We just we, whatever's going on that day, we just get thrown out there and we do it. Never, never two days the same way. Yeah. He lived that life before it was officially made into a title, yeah. right? And and he did it in such a way that you know his AOR is literally hundreds of miles, mm -hmm. right? And his impact was felt in other places in terms of people in other places heard of him and knew of him. Like Chief Collier went and, you know, he went to El Paso and then later he was, you know, over the northern border, the whole northern border. And then he became the chief of the patrol. And, you know, these, you know, people went to Washington and, you know, he got a call from a guy, you know, get on a train, get to New York, you know, I need you here, you know, hey, you're going to go marry Kid Iraq, you know, she was a uh, a rancher's wife that wrote a book that came out in the 30s called Border Patrol that, you know, she talks about it, you know, and so she's South Texas. <laughs> people know, you know, people knew him and knew of him and his reputation was known far and wide and was was held in esteem. Yes, and the um, distance between that and today does not diminish that in the no, slightest. No, it in does the not. Slightest. It's just, it's really, like I said, it's been a long time that I've been cutting sign, and it's yeah. been a long time that I've been chasing these trails, and I'm really, I'm really happy that I have a space right now to, to talk about him and some of the things that I've done, you know, with you and, and things like that, and Hopefully, you know, as I build out my website and, and that people will have access to that and access to the things that I come across. And I'll probably, I don't know, I'll do videos or blogs or vlogs or whatever, but I'll yes. talk about different things that I find. And, you know, it'll probably be a hot mess when it's all said and done. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> like, it's going to be good, though. It's going to be good. So last few words, uh, you know, before we close out for the day. Um, It's 2024. I mean, we turn a hundred this year and, you know, let's, let's keep this memory alive. Let's, let's bring this to the next generation. Let's continue to show the next generation where they, you know, the, the foundations of their agency. Let, let's continue to talk about the trails and the places and the, you know, when they're out there cutting sign and they're walking the ground, they'll be like, I'm walking in those footsteps. I'm, I, I literally, we, you know, we walk in big boot prints. Yeah. You know, and 
you know, and we <clears throat> hopefully, you know, more things will come along and more people will know about him. And, and then we can start into the, you know, once we get, it'll be a long time before we get through Milton, but once we get through Milton, you know, then I'll have a chance to start chasing some of these other guys, you know? Yeah. And like you said, right. Um, these guys. other guys, Earl Fallis, George Harris, Nick Collier, uh, Dogie, right. I mean, those guys in, yeah. in and of themselves, Bill Jordan. I mean, my gosh, I mean, there's, yeah. we come, we, we have come from a rich history, heritage yeah. and legacy. And I hope to explore all that stuff. Maybe when I'm not so busy with, you know, a few border issues, you know, I just like to tell the chief right now, you know, would you mind take, getting that fixed up and taken care of so I can get on with my life and start doing other fun stuff like history, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and there's so many and I, it's, I want to create what I would love to do is to create a, a drive in agent to go find those old timers and capture those stories and yeah. who they were and what they did and, and how they did what they did and to show them what we do today. And, you know, we, you know, find those guys because we lose them. And yeah, you know, I've been trying real hard to get a hold of, of people in the old patrol, but I got uh, quite a few podcasts with a lot of old timers that were in session 66 in the in the early sessions, I have the the uh, uh, the very first academy at Bortac that ever went out, and the story of that, and right. uh, a lot of stuff like that. But I'm all yeah, I am also desperate to collect as many stories of the old patrol as possible, so we can be able to share them with, continue to share them amongst each other, and talk about right. them as war stories. All right, brother. Well, thank you so much for today. This was awesome. I can't wait to get it ready and put it out for everybody to see. And so until maybe next week, we'll uh, we'll go back and continue on the, yeah, the, still, the, the we'll, life and times. Yeah, we'll pick back up at the end of Texas time and, and the Rangers and start delving into more into the, you know, where he went after the Rangers and what he did then. Yeah. Because we're not, we haven't even touched the epic, legendary quotes and statements and confrontations with the herbs, confrontations with John Wesley Harden, and yeah. all those great times. So, yeah. yet to come. There's a lot of interesting characters. <laughs> can't wait. Can't wait, so, brother. Well, thank yeah. you. Cool. Be good. Be safe.